Hey everyone, my name is Brent Strawn. I teach at Duke University, so I'm coming to you from Durham, North Carolina. I'm very thankful for everyone at NASA who allowed me to share uh, in this series on the Psalms with you, especially my good friend Corey Berg, uh, but several others too who've helped make this possible, especially the tech part. The uh, upside of this current state of being we're in, I suppose, one very small upside is the uh, increased use of technology, which allows this sort of distance teaching to happen. And so I'm thankful to be with you for six weeks on the Psalms. We've called this series, Psalms and the Life of Faith in 2020, Praise, Sorrow, and Curse. And so this is the first of six sessions. Um, I'll be with you on the Psalms and the Life of Faith. So what I'd like to do in this first session is give you a brief introduction to the Psalms and to sort of where we're going with this series and then uh, we'll start diving in more in greater detail into specific Psalms and Psalm types in the weeks to come. So first let me just say that on the one hand the Psalms don't need much introduction. They are deeply loved. I mean even New Testament only Bibles which are a terrible idea to someone in my line of work right as an Old Testament professor. It's a bad idea New Testament only Bibles. Even those frequently have to include the Psalms don't they? Um, they're just deeply loved but deeply loved does not translate always into adequately known or rightly understood or correctly utilized. So we should be beware of a sterile but non-substantial respect that we might give to the Psalms. Sterile respect does not translate into the transformational engagement with the Psalms that we most want and need for the life of faith, especially now in 2020 with uh, praise, sorrow, and curse. Uh, just with us um, constantly on the news crawl and in the mirror. In fact, a point of confluence between the deeply loved nature of the Psalms, but also in the church at least, their inadequately known nature is in fact these lament Psalms that speak to the grief and sorrow that frequently accompany the, the life of faith. Now, we could appeal to some great testimonies in the history of Christianity uh, and Judaism for that matter on how important the Psalms have been for real faith. Uh, Luther, you might recall, uh, in his preface to the Psalms in 1531 said, nothing has yet appeared that is superior to the Psalms. And the Psalms, he said, may be fairly called a little Bible in which everything that is in the whole Bible is contained in a beautiful and compendious manner. And of course he goes on to talk about how it teaches us about the saints and preeminently about the ultimate saint, namely Jesus Christ. John Calvin, particularly important to the Nassau Presbyterian Church, I'm sure. John Calvin in his commentary on the book of Psalms in 1563 says that he has been accustomed to call the book of Psalms, I think not inappropriately, an anatomy of all parts of the soul. For there is not an emotion of which anyone can be conscious that is not here represented as in a mirror. Or rather, the Holy Spirit has here drawn to life all the griefs, sorrows, fears, doubts, hopes, cares, perplexities, in short, all the distracting emotions with which the minds of men and women are wont to be agitated. There's Calvin in his commentary on the Psalms 1563. So if you combine that, the Psalms as a mini Bible plus an anatomy of the soul, what we might say is that when we get into the Psalms, we are in an advanced theology class uh, that's gonna engage the full orbed nature of our faith. But it's also a case that we might be in the, an advanced anatomy class. Uh, and that in an anatomy class, we might encounter astonishing and at times disgusting parts of the body of faith and yet fully and in very important functional parts of the faith. Either way we ignore the Psalms at our own great peril and of course the saints of the church have not in the history of Christianity. So that's just a quick uh, kind of testimonial about the importance of the Psalms in the history of the church. If we turn to some orienting basics, kind of getting the lay of the land of the Psalms, uh, we could just say a couple things briefly. The book of Psalms is sometimes called the Psalter. That language comes from the Greek 
which is a psalmoi, which is songs sung on a lyre, or the psalterion, which is a lyre. In Hebrew, a, a lyre, the, this kind, not the person who spouts on truth, of course, uh, but I digress. Uh, in Hebrew, the book is called Tehillim, the book of praises. There are 150 psalms, um, depending on how you count, and in fact, that's a point of debate in the manuscript tradition. But eventually, we get a, a final coalescence of the 150 psalms in the shape that we have them now. And these are divided into five books. Each book has a concluding doxology, so 1 through 41, 42 to 72, 73 to 89, 90 to 106, and 107 to 150 are the five books. And some have thought that perhaps these five books of David, as it were, are to correspond somehow to the five books of Moses. There's various sub-collections in the book of Psalms. There are Psalms attributed to or ascribed to or in honor of David. Uh, that's a decent number, but not all of them. And even those we should point out are not clearly necessarily written by David. The little preposition in Hebrew that, that occurs with that of David or by David or to David could mean any number of those things. So it might be dedicated to David or in Davidic mode. But nevertheless, there's Psalms of David or, or ascribed to David. Also, Psalms ascribed to Asaph and Korah. Solomon, there's even one for Moses, Psalm 90. There's other various sub-collections we could mention, some of which, not all, which have superscriptions of a sort, which include these people's names that I've just mentioned, but also musical terms and other such things. As far as dating the Psalms, it's hard to know when to place them um, in the history of ancient Israel. We, we might say only God knows about the dating of the Psalms, with a few exceptions uh, that we'll talk about in due course. Now, one of the more important things, I mean, besides sort of authorship, which I think we can't really know about, or date, which we also are unclear on, one of the things we can be certain about are the kind of genres or types the Psalms uh, fall into. So there are 150 psalms, but there are not 150 different types of psalms. In fact, there's a much reduced number of types or genres or kinds of psalms. It was the great insight of Hermann Gunkel uh, in uh, the early 20th century to realize this and to basically say all psalms are not the same. And yet, many psalms are similar. So many psalms are similar, even though they're not exactly the same. This was the great insight into uh, the psalms that Gunkel was famous for, and he was quite famous for, which always makes me think, I was born too late. You know, I think I could have come up with that kind of insight. I think, maybe not, it might have been beyond me, but I'm, I think I might have been able to say some of the psalms look similar. And then you know, if I'd been er born earlier, I might have, uh, you know, a certain level of notoriety like the great Hermann Gunkel, who was great for lots of reasons. But in any event, uh, Gunkel's great insight was that there are three primary types of psalms, and more than that according to him, but really the three big ones for our purposes are, not surprisingly in light of our title for this six-week series, hymns of praise, Songs of lament, psalms of lament, and then songs of thanksgiving. So, praise, sorrow, curse, as it were, uh, though curse is really a subsection of these sorrowful uh, psalms, the lament psalms, and then the, the songs of thanksgiving. So, the big three, again, are hymns of praise, psalms of lament, and songs of thanksgiving. And, interestingly enough, the lament psalms and the songs of Thanksgiving occur in two different types, individual and communal types. The individual is uh, where the psalmist speaks in the first person, I, and the communal where the poet speaks in the first person, plural, we. So that's the difference between the individual and communal, quite, quite straightforward. But the key insight from Gunkel is praise, lament, thanksgiving, these three. And if we would say, but these three remain, the greatest of these is lament. Lament is the one type that occurs more than any other type. Depends on who you ask, but approximately 
50. So a third of the book of Psalms is in fact uh, lament psalms. So it's the backbone of the Psalter, as it were. So one of the correlate insights from Google was that the uh, similarity of the Psalms wasn't just sort of in tone or mood, but sometimes in specific elements, uh, formal qualities, uh, structure. Um, movement, rhetorical flow, as it were. Not unlike how we write business letters now or uh, and how a business letter differs from a love note or how one might follow certain forms to appropriately write a haiku or a sonnet. Um, you know, or when you pull up your, your word processing program and you start a new document and it gives you a bunch of templates to select. Uh, that's, that's not unlike what was going on in the ancient world. They had their literary conventions as well. And these literary conventions, Grunkel called literary forms, types, or genres. So uh, let me give you an example of this. Uh, if, if, if we were writing a lament psalm today and we were typing away on our Microsoft Word. Uh, this is a little old school, but you'll, you'll get it, I think. Let me switch over to my screen and see if this works. If, if we were doing this, you might start typing in your Microsoft Word and up might come that little Microsoft Assistant that mercifully has been put to rest by, by the Microsoft Corporation, but nevertheless, it used to come up. It looked like a little, you know, paper clip and uh, you know you'd start typing something and it would pop up and say looks like you're writing a letter we can help you with that so if you were doing this in the ancient world you know you might start writing a psalm how long how long oh lord all night I cry out to you and up would come the little Microsoft assistant he looking like Moses probably office assistant can help you write your lament psalm first just tell us the source of your pain you just click on the button enemies god myself or maybe tips option or close this uh, captures how in the ancient world in ancient israel if you wanted to write a lament psalm you followed a certain kind of form and the same is true for the praise songs and the songs of thanksgiving now I'm going to leave this screen up for a second and move to another screen because one of the key things that we'll be looking at in our six weeks together is how Walter Brueggemann has come along and talked about Grunkel's categories with reference to seasons of human life. So Brueggemann has a different typology. It still is related to Grunkel's big three, praise, lament, and songs of thanksgiving, but Brueggemann's insight was to correlate these with major seasons of life, which he got from the philosopher Paul Ricoeur. These seasons of life are orientation, disorientation, or and reorientation, or sometimes called new orientation. And what Brueggemann says, building off of Ricoeur, is that one moves from orientation to disorientation, and one can after disorientation, move to new or reorientation, and then perhaps back to orientation. Or at least the reorientation becomes a new orientation and you go on from there. Now, what Brueggemann did was correlate these three seasons of life, as it were, with the three main genres identified in the Psalms by Gunkel. So, the hymns of praise corresponded to times of orientation. That's when life is all going really well. We're oriented. Things are happy and good and settled and peaceful and secure. The Psalms of Lament correspond to the season of disorientation when things are not settled, not secure, but profoundly at ill ease. When we are disturbed, troubled, sick, uh, oppressed, you name it. And then the reorientation season of life seems to correspond to these songs of thanksgiving, that third major genre that Gunkel identified in the Psalms. Now, Brueggemann also went on to talk about how the movement from orientation to disorientation is a painful one. No one really wants to move from orientation to disorientation. And the movement is typically accomplished because of a bad thing, something bad happens, a call comes in the night, we lose a loved one, we have a bad diagnosis, etc. And then the movement from disorientation to reorientation, Brueggemann said, is 
the result of an unexplained new thing. Some unexpected novum has happened. It's, it's not unlike, Brueggemann says, the New Testament movement from the, the cross on Good Friday to the empty tomb on Easter Sunday. And then finally, there's a question of whether one moves from reorientation back to orientation in a kind of cycle, or if one just remains in the new orientation and then could perhaps be disoriented from that again in the future. Brueggemann didn't want this to be a, he didn't want it to be a, a mechanistic or cyclical uh, type of of understanding of the Psalms, but an, a functional one, a definitely a functional one. And that function had to do with the seasons of life and how the Psalms fit those seasons of life. That helps us maybe understand where they come from. That is, maybe the people who write, who wrote the hymns of praise were well off, uh, safe, secure, settled, happy. Certainly those who wrote the Lament Psalms were not feeling those ways, but were feeling profoundly sorrowful, sad, in pain, and hurt. And then the New Orientation Psalms seem to be written by those people who have emerged on the other side of that disorientation. So where the Psalms emerge from is one way to understand this typology of function. But another way to think about it is how to use those Psalms now. And so for Brueggemann, that typology that he's introduced that, that correlates these seasons of life with Gunkel's categories is primarily for us to think about how we use the Psalms in our own lives now in the life of faith. When we are in seasons of disorientation, therefore, we need the Psalms of Lament. When we emerge from those seasons of disorientation, if and when we do, we, we need those songs of thanksgiving. And when all is well with our soul, we need those hymns of praise. These uh, help us in our own life of faith, but they also might help us in how we use the Psalms and think about the Psalms with reference to other people and their lives of faith. A lot of pastoral care, after all, takes place among lay people when they say things or don't say things, when they mean well or when they don't mean well. And usually in the ICU or heaven forbid, in the morgue, one doesn't need a psalm of orientation, a hymn of praise, but rather a psalm of disorientation, a lament psalm. So this typology is about function, and we're going to dive into its specific parts, uh, orientation next week, disorientation, new orientation, and so forth. But the major takeaway that I want us to not miss right now is what Brueggemann's typology shows and what Gunkel's categories show is that the Psalms are on the move. The Psalms are not just one thing. It's not just one thing over and over again, 150 times. They are on the move. They're doing things. That means the life of faith is also on the move. And that means that these various seasons of life that are reflected in the Psalms, all of those seasons of life are equally part of the life of faith. If you grew up around church like me, you might not have gotten that message. You know, you might have gotten the message that only the kind of praise and the happy times and all that, that was really the life of faith. Not, not the other stuff, not the questioning of God, not the doubting of God, not the screaming at God, not the strong words against one's enemies, etc. Those were things to not consider as part of the life of faith. But not so, says the Psalms. Not so. All of that that is present in the Psalms is part of the life of faith. That means disorientation, too, is equally a part of our life with God. That might be the most important takeaway from this morning's lecture or this first uh, session. I'm saying this morning because I'm assuming you'll watch it in the morning, but who knows? Some of you might be night owls. More than watchmen watch for the morning. That's in the Psalms, isn't it? Okay, final thing I want to say about the Psalms before I conclude this first session is to comment on how the Psalms are poetry. This is obvious on the one hand, and yet very, very crucial. Here we have theology presented to us in poetic form and evidently in musical form too. The Psalms are frequently called the hymn book of the Second Temple period. 
and there are musical notations in the superscriptions and perhaps elsewhere in the Psalms as, as well, particularly in that word Silah, which we still don't really know what that word means. It's usually not translated, it's just put into English characters and printed in the Psalms, Silah, S-E-L-A-H. I tell my students whenever they're reading publicly scripture in church and they come across a Silah, they should just read it very loudly and authoritatively. Silah! Because if nothing else, it gets people's attention. And, um, you know, sometimes you have to do that in church. My other favorite explanation of Silah was David Hubbards, who was the former president of Fuller Theological Seminary, who said Silah was what David said every time he broke a harp spring. You know, playing on Silah! So there you go, two, two theories. Uh, you heard them here first. All right, but the Psalms are poetry, and it's very important to pay attention to their poetic elements. The primary one we might notice will be parallelism, which is the way two or three lines in Hebrew poetry will echo each other, relate to each other in some fashion. You can find this really anywhere in the Psalms and really anywhere in Hebrew poetry. In fact, it's not just in Hebrew poetry like the prophets and the wisdom literature and Psalms. It's, it's found widely in Semitic poetry more generally. Brought over into English poetry, by the way, by Hopkins, who was a great fan of biblical poetry. But here's just one example from Psalm 24.1. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. You know this one. The world and all its inhabitants. There's the first line and the second line, and they echo each other in some way. They they are in parallel with one another. The earth is the Lord's and all that it holds, the world and all its inhabitants. The earth and the world stand in this relationship of parallelism, all that it holds and all its inhabitants parallel. So uh, these, this is the way Hebrew poetry works um, stylistically. One of the primary ways it works stylistically, not the only way, but certainly one of the primary ways. And the, but the way these lines interrelate is actually a complicated question. It's been frequently said, though too simplistically said, that the nature of the relationship is either um, synonymous, um, antithetical, or synthetic in some way. Another way to put this would be that the two lines are either affirming, contrasting, or developing dynamic in some session. So some lines, like the ones I just read out of Psalm 24, would be thought to be synonymous parallels. They say basically the same thing. They're affirming. Contrasting, the B line would say something different, and uh, the, affir the uh, dynamic, developing, or synthetic type, would the B line would say something different, would carry the thought further. But even in the synonymous type of parallelism, the two lines aren't saying exactly the same thing. And so it's important to note that the two lines together are making a predication and developing the thought. But that is the thought, that the two lines together constitute a predication. So we'll see this sort of stuff in the, uh, over and over again in the Psalms as we, as we look at them. Um, other things we could say about poetry in the Psalms besides parallelism is that there'll be a lot of imagery, a lot of metaphor, symbolism, and so forth. Samuel Taylor Coleridge said that poetry was the best words in the best order. And um, Roman Jakobsen, the great Russian linguist, uh, spoke of the poetic function, which is the way poetic language calls attention to itself, usually by its difficulty, its spareness, its terseness, and so forth. So, for our purposes, I'd like to think of four things about Hebrew poetry. One is the poetic function, as I just described it, parallelism, the density of imagery and metaphor, and the fact that most of our psalms are uh, what we would call lyric poems, short lyric poems. Let me just close then with one example briefly that I know your um, church will be coming back to in homiletical form later in this series. That's Psalm 82. Uh, here's the psalm and if I show you uh, a couple slides we might see a few things. So first off there's the psalm of Asaph that shows you that not all the psalms are dedicated to 
David, there's Asaph in yellow there, and there's Selah, Selah, or please get me a new harp string because I've broken it. But what about the poetic function? Here's the poetic function in Psalm 82. The use of the word Elohim for God is used four times, you see here, and, it not, and it's kind of tricky. Elohim, God, has taken his place in the divine council, or the council of God, that is here, El, not Elohim. In the midst of the gods, Elohim, he holds judgment. So that very first sentence is tricky because Elohim in the first instance is singular and Elohim in the second instance is plural. That's the poetic function. That's the poet using some words in tricky ways so that we have to slow down and pay attention. Parallelism is uh, here in these blue lines. Uh, I, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Well, parallelism is in all these lines, but, but look at these three verses in a row are uh, quite uh, closely related. Um, but then you get a development in five, six, seven, and eight, what would be called this sort of dynamic or developing or synthetic parallelism. So what's most important though, I think about this Psalm is in fact the primary image or metaphor, which is that of a courtroom, a divine courtroom, uh, or even a boardroom where God has summoned the gods in for a meeting and condemned them all to mortality because they don't take care of the lowly and the needy. So that concludes the first session. Thanks for hanging in with me the whole time. I may have run a wee bit long. That's my problem. I'm working on it. In any event, our preliminary conclusions would just be that if the Psalms are indeed a detailed anatomy of, of the soul, then there's going to be one, more than one body part to know. And that means the Psalter has more than one type of Psalm. And these Psalms might have more than one type of function in the life of faith our own faith, and the faith of others. And if these variegated psalm types and psalm functions comprise a compendium of theology, like, say, Calvin and Luther thought, then we might have to learn how to dance with different partners in the psalms. And we might have to learn how to dance differently with different partners. So I'm really looking forward to our time together. Thank you for uh, tuning in. And uh, if you are really brave you can take a look at the homework for next time there's some psalms to have a look at and if you're really truly devout boy have a go at psalm 19 119 super long 176 verses to be precise these psalms are among the psalms of orientation and that's the ones we'll look at next time thanks so much for again your attention and tuning in. I look forward to the upcoming weeks. Take care. Bye.